All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, I think we're all in for a treat. I'm Rosalind Picard, for those who don't know me. I'm a professor at the MIT Media Lab and one of the um, people behind the advancing well-being movement here and also faculty chair of MIT's Mind, Hand, Heart. But today, it's my super pleasure to welcome Dr. Barbara Fredrickson. Uh, I had heard about her work for decades here. Uh, very um, significant in changing the field of psychology and I think having findings that will impact all of us here increasingly. Uh, the basics are she's the Keenan Distinguished Professor of Psychology at UNC Chapel Hill. She uh, also heads a lab called Positive Emotions and Psychophysiology, PEP acronym. Uh, she has a bachelor's in psychology from Carleton College, a doctorate from Stanford and did a postdoc at UC Berkeley. She's won a bunch of awards. Uh, two of them are the American Psychological Association's inaugural Templeton Prize in Positive Psychology, and also the Society of Experimental Social Psychology's Career Trajectory Award. I think you're probably at least most famous in our circles for the broaden and build theory of positive emotions, and maybe what people don't realize when they just focus on the emotion is all the connections um, to our own health and well-being, and what a difference that can make. Uh, she's had a huge scientific impact and popular impact uh, in not just in academia, but in the business world and education. Uh, work featured in New York Times, Sunday Magazine, CNN, PBS, US News, World Report, USA Today, Oprah. Uh, she has briefed the Dalai Lama on her research. Soon she'll be able to say she briefed MIT on her research. Um, the author of Positivity, which is a general audience book, uh, although rooted in great science. And um, more recently, the book Love 2.0, uh, discussing the emotion that emotion theorists don't usually touch. Love to hear more why that is. Um, the emotion of love, uh, but bringing the science of um, you know, good, rigorous methodology to that, and helping us understand how it can affect biological and cellular makeup as well. So without further ado, it's awesome to have you here. Thank you. Thanks, it's great to be here. I, um, I get the chance to share with you some of the research from my uh, team at the PEP lab. And just to give a shout out to them, the kind of work that I'm gonna share with you is certainly not stuff that one person could do alone. So I have had a great team of graduate students and staff and undergrads all helping me out. And uh, uh, generous support from the National Institutes of Health. And I'm gonna be talking to you about what is a smile for? and more generally, the value of face-to-face -face connections. Now, I know that at one level, you already know, face-to-face -face connection is uh, a valuable part of daily experience. Your parents, your grandparents are probably going to tell me that. I have more connection with people. Um, and so I want to be able to help you appreciate why that is the case from um, both the side of mental health and the side of physical health, and why um, positive face-to-face -face connection is so critical for us human animals. And I'm going to be using as the platform for this work the broad and build theory of positive emotions, which has been the blueprint of my research for the last several decades. And uh, it really was among the first scientific treatments of trying to understand why humans have positive emotions in the first place. And uh, so I'm going to give you a, a swift review of just sort of the nuts and bolts of that before we go further. Now the most important uh, initial concept to keep in mind is that emotions are very short-lived. They're like a wave uh, rising up on the, on the sea and then uh, they dissipate within seconds, maybe minutes. But something that's lasting uh, hours, weeks, months, that's not an emotion anymore. It might be emotion related or emotional trait, but I'm going to be talking about these fleeting experiences uh, that are like a smile, that change our inner psychology and our brain, brain functioning and physiology little by little. Okay, so these very short-lived experiences were often just ignored by psychologists because they, again, were so fleeting, how could they matter? And for positive emotions, they're all rather mild, typically. Uh, but one key way that positive emotions, even mild positive emotions, maybe especially mild positive emotions, 
they fundamentally change the way the human brain works and how we take in information. And in particular, uh, a key thing that positive emotions do is they broaden our awareness. So uh, just like this water lily opens and closes with the presence and absence of sunlight, our minds open and close with the presence and absence of subtle, fleeting, positive emotional experiences. We know this from eye tracking studies. We know this from behavioral choice studies. We know this from brain imaging studies. Um, so there are many ways in which positive emotion just kind of expand the boundaries, expand our peripheral vision. So that's sort of how literal this broadened perspective is. And when we are able to see a broader field, we're able to integrate uh, more diverse concepts and ideas. And that, may, that is a feature of positive emotions, the broaden effect, which, like a positive emotion, is also fleeting. So we have these moments of expanded awareness, but when the positive emotion is gone, we kind of go back to typical. When we experience negative emotions, our focus narrows even further. But that is consequential, because little by little, having more of these moments where your mind is expanded, that your awareness is broadened, changes you, little by little, puts you on a trajectory of growth that builds your resources. And so the analogy I make is to eating your fruits and vegetables. Um, we know that having you know, just uh, one stem of broccoli in 2018 is not going to make you healthy. You need a steady diet of fruits and vegetables as part of your daily health behaviors. Uh, positive emotions can be counted in that same way. Having just one positive emotion isn't going to do much for your health, but having a steady diet of positive emotions uh, within one's daily experience is, uh, puts you on a trajectory of, uh, one way to say it is just becoming the best version of yourself, becoming more resourceful. Uh, it, it builds social resources, um, psychological resources like resilience, cognitive resources like the ability to stay within the present moment, mindfulness. And um, we'll talk about how it builds physical resources in terms of healthy profiles. Um, a colleague of mine pointed out this study some time ago on bee emotions. I didn't know there was a whole field of emotion in bees. But uh, the findings actually really map onto the broad and build theory. It's, it's surprising. I would have thought that maybe it would be in common with mammals, that our human positive emotional experiences were in common with mammals. But apparently, bees, too, de um, depending on the sweetness of the nectar that they consume, they're more likely to be exploring more broadly in their environment and uh, able to bounce back from a little bee challenge. Um, how they challenge bees in the laboratory is just get them in a tube and then hold them still. There's an a, there's a analogous way that uh, makes babies upset by having, uh, holding babies' arms down. Um, and it makes them kind of upset. Bees get upset in that state too. And if they've had more sweet nectar prior to that, they bounce back from the threat faster. Um, so uh, just like uh, uh, humans bounce back better when they kind of have a store of positive emotions in their history and recent history. So there's something about the nervous system and how dopamine energizes our nervous system that is in common across many different kinds of nervous systems. Okay, animals that uh, move and forage need to explore their environments. Humans are no different. Positive emotions help put us in a mode that facilitates exploration and trying new things. Now, another way positive emotions broaden our awareness is to, it unlocks other focus. Most of the time, humans are pretty self-absorbed. We're kind of wrapped up in our own to-do list, our own set of goals, our own worries and concerns. And it can take um, a little uh, disruption of positive emotion to make us realize that there are other people in the room. <laughs> I might have a, a, a something in common with somebody else. And so positive emotion seems to um, break open that cocoon of self-absorption and allow us to see ourselves as more connected and more of a piece with others. So we think people think and speak more in terms of we than in terms of me versus you. Uh, we also see something very interesting with uh, 
smile mimicry. Well, you, you probably all encountered in your own experience and learning about a little bit about emotion science is that we tend to mimic each other's facial expressions. There's something particularly interesting about what happens when we mimic smiles. There are known to be so many different kinds of smiles. Paul Eklund, who's the major emotion theorist who has studied the face, argues that there are 50 kinds of smiles. Some of those smiles are, hey, I'm interested in getting to know you. Um, let's connect. That's considered an affiliative smile. There's also um, enjoyment smiles, which would be, you know, I'm over here enjoying my chocolate, oblivious to what's going on with some of anybody else in the room. And then there are what are called domineering smiles, which is the kind of, you know, I'm better than you, and I know it, and I'm going to make you feel that. You know, that sort of, you know, it's not even all that positive, but it still goes, shows up with a smile. And so how do people understand all the differences between these different kinds of smiles? Well, it turns out that mimicking the smile is key. Because when we mimic the smile, we um, are not only um, moving the same muscles on our face, there's sort of a neural mimicry that uh, goes on with that that allows people to, to feel a little bit of what the other person is feeling. So if there was sort of this domineering smile, and you make eye contact with someone and mimic that smile, you're more likely to think, oh yeah, this is one of those slimy smiles. I mean, that's just the way it informs your gut and tells you that maybe this isn't a friendly person after all. Now, um, eye contact is really key to this, because mimicry doesn't occur nearly as much when people don't make eye contact. So being face to face with someone and being able to look into their eyes triggers the mimicry that triggers um, what you could call intersubjectivity, or understanding the subtleties of another person's intentions. Okay, so smile mimicry is something that happens when you're face to face, and it um, uh, basically accounts for people having the sense of, I don't know if I trust this person, or oh, definitely trust this person. Um, and the sad part is, is that when we don't make eye contact and we don't mimic, we just don't have access to the same gut wisdom about what somebody else is feeling. And one of the things that I've argued, uh, well, when I, when I first started working in the area of positive emotions, I was um, discovering in my studies and my theorizing was matching this. I kind of thought all positive emotions were the same. They're all, uh, we have evidence that many different positive emotions broaden awareness. Uh, many of them build uh, resources. They tend to occur in blends, so it's kind of hard sometimes to separate the influences of different uh, positive emotions. But um, through the data building up in my laboratory, I've come to believe that there is one positive emotion that, if you make the analogy to fruits and vegetables, that uh, maybe there's one that's a superfood. Now, my, my son, who's here with me, not in the room, but he tells me, Mom, there's no such thing as superfoods. That's a myth. <laughs> so I still want to use this analogy that there may be one kind of positive emotion that's more consequential for our um, growth and development than others. And that um, is what got me interested in studying love. Now, I have a very different take on love than a lot of emotion scientists, which probably is what allowed me to um, dive into this area when most people didn't want it. It was like um, the third rail, you don't want to touch it. Um, and that is because I, there's an uh, earlier emotion theorist, um, Cal Azar, who took a similar view, and I thought this makes a lot of sense. I argue that love is any positive emotion that is co-experienced across people. So instead of thinking of emotions as simply being owned by an individual, which is the way our language tends to focus on, it's like, your joy, his anxiety, and we kind of parse them out as belonging to people. If you really look at how emo emotions unfold, oftentimes they're very much unfolding across multiple brains and bodies at once, in synchrony. So that's what, I, when positive emotions are in synchrony like that, that's what I'm calling positivity resonance. And I'm arguing that it's a, one of the building blocks of love, like perhaps the most elemental building block of love. So I just want to give you a few visual images of this to help you know, like get you on the same page of what I'm talking about. So it could be sharing a laugh uh, with a friend. It could be um, celebrating a coworker's success. 
Uh, it could be um, hugging your neighbor um, in a difficult moment. And this may not seem like positivity, shared positivity is the primary feature, and it's not. I and mean, the, the primary emotion in the room may be um, hurt and compassion and concern. But when somebody meets another person in their hurt, there's an element of good feeling in there. It's relief that somebody understood you or is taking the time to try to understand you. And the person who's able to kind of be that shoulder, uh, so lean on, feels a sense of, at least I was there, at least I was able to help a little bit. And this is where um, a very well-earned feeling of mild pride could come in. And pride, people have a hard time sometimes accepting that as a positive emotion, but it just means Something good happened and I was responsible, you know, that the self is responsible. So even though the predominant emotion and compassion situation may be negative, there is a shared positivity that runs through that. I think the clearest example of positivity resonance is smiling at a baby. And this doesn't even have to be your baby. It can be a baby on the plane or the baby in the restaurant. And the reason that this is such a good, clear example is that you know, when you're interacting with a pre-verbal infant, you're doing it as a dance. There's a dance of mutual synchrony and smiles, and you've you got to get it just right, otherwise they might start screaming. So you're being really <laughs> sensitive to like what's making them happy. Um, and it's, it unfolds as a little, um, as just a, this little emotional dance um, that has joy in it. And uh, research shows that when parents have this sort of temporal synchrony and positivity with their infants that the parents and the infants show rises and falls in oxytocin that are correlated. Okay, so even um, oxytocin is a neuropeptide that has been linked to bonding and other uh, uh, key parts of social behavior. As in safe context, oxytocin is also related to sort of guarding boundaries of groups and so it's not always uh, leading to just positive or associated with positive experiences. So um, I just want to share a little bit about the, some of the ideas I'm bringing together in what I call positivity resonance theory. Um, and it, it's a mashup of two different areas of psych psychological science. Um, my home discipline is affective science or emotion science. But I'm also bringing in ideas from relationship science, where uh, some of my close collaborators have pointed me to some of the most important aspects of that. And one is a definition of love that has been um, discovered by asking people to think about all kinds of relationships, like the love you might have for your romantic partner, but also the love you have for your child, or for your parents, or for your best friend. And then um, they just ask people to subtract certain ingredients from that relationship. Would you still call it a love relationship? And this is the um, description that people are not willing to take away and still call it a love relationship. And so that is investing in the well-being of the other person simply for his or her own sake. Okay, so you know, when you just really appreciate someone because they make you breakfast in the morning or they kill the spiders in your house, it's not, um, that, it's not that functional um, uh, kind of appreciation. You just you care about their well-being regardless, just for his or her own sake. And this is really key, because one of my earlier research areas was on the objectification of women. So if there's, there's a way in which you know, objectifying somebody else is, is um, appreciating them for what they do for you, as opposed to appreciating them for, what, uh, for their own well-being. And the flip side of that, when somebody is invested in you simply for your own sake, it feels like they get you. They're on your side. And the jargon phrase for that is perceived responsiveness or uh, feeling like you're understood, cared for, and validated. And then um, in, uh, relationship scientists have argued that the fundamental core of intimacy is mutual perceived responsiveness. You both feel like you understand, care for, and validate one another. Now, um, these are really important ideas from relationship science. What I think emotion science can add is uh, a momentary lens. There's, a, some, there's kind of a uh, sense that goes through relationship science that really views relationships almost as a status that toggles on, you're in a relationship, or it toggles off if you break up or get divorced or 
um, have a falling out. What emotion science adds is that these moments of feeling that um, somebody cares for you or that you're invested in somebody else, those are emotional moments that are like that wave that rises up and dissipates. And then you go off and work on your problem set or your go to work and you're not necessarily at that moment um, investing in the well-being of another person. The other thing that emotion science can add is in the biological and behavioral components because emotions by definition are both mind and body experiences and biological and phenomenological and whereas relation science almost seems like it's hovering inside of people's minds only um, in terms of uh, switching into a different category of connection. And then the other thing it can add is this broad and build theoretical backdrop, which acknowledges that there are some features of the experience that are transient. And that those transient features end up being really consequential in terms of the resources that they build. And so one of the things I argue is that a lot of the other things that we typically consider to be love are really the resources that are built as these moments of, of positivity resonance accrue. So just to define it formally, a positivity resonance is an interpersonally situated um, experience marked by momentary increases in shared positive emotions, mutual care and concern, and biological and behavioral synchrony. And those are the momentary aspects. These three facets are kind of braided together in that momentary wave. Uh, and over time, having more such moments build embodied rapport, or just as you walk away from the interaction and you think, oh, we really clicked, we really connected, um, it builds uh, social bonds. A lot of times we take the social bonds themselves to be, oh, that's love. And this other stuff is just sort of what love feels like. Um, another, another thing people take to be love is commitment, loyalty, and trust. Uh, and it can often seem mysterious. How do I build commitment? How do I build loyalty? How do I build trust? Um, whether, and that's something that is important in education and business and all kinds of arenas. And it can seem like a mystery. From the perspective of this theory, you build those by creating more of these momentary experiences of shared positivity with this biobehavioral synchrony and mutual care and concern. So uh, you'll notice here that I talk about interpersonally situated experiences. I stop short of saying face to face, but I do think what's required is real time sensory connection. So something that um, is happening dynamically in real time uh, and it's possible to experience it, say, over the phone because shared voice carries a lot of information about emotion through the vocal tract. Um, so the um, major hypothesis that I'm working with is arguing that these micro moments or these momentary experiences of positivity resonance are the most elemental building blocks of what we typically think of as love relationships, bonded relationships, trusting, loyal relationships. And I would argue also from the findings that we have, it's a, a fundamental building block of health. And so I want to give you a sense of how we measure positivity resonance. We do this in multiple different ways. We're kind of trying to triangulate it from many different sides. But one way that we've developed is through a short questionnaire. And the, this is a questionnaire that's suitable for describing episodes. Because again, positivity resonance is something that occurs in interaction with others. So typically, one way we measure this is have people think about their day yesterday and divide yesterday into a series of episodes. It might be 10 episodes, it might be 20. But an episode would be, um, uh, one episode would be coming to this talk. Another episode could be, you know, um, taking an hour to catch up on my email. Or another episode could be a meeting with your um, collaborative team. Okay, so things like that. And then we ask for what proportion of time in that episode did you feel, and then we use these items, uh, did you feel a sense of mutual sense of warmth and concern? Were you able to attune to and connect with one another? 
Did thoughts and feelings flow with ease? Did you feel a mutual sense of being energized and uplifted? Were you mutually responsive to one another's needs? Did you sense mutual trust and respect? And did you feel in sync? Of course. Um, people respond for each item from 0 to 100%. People are hardly ever at 100%. So um, there's just, you know, within an episode, you might feel, you know, about 20% of the time, we felt this, you know, uh, energized and uplifted kind of response. And what we find is that um, uh, there are, if we ask, were, was that episode face to face? Was it connected um, through um, technology? Or was it connected through a phone or um, video chat? We find that if you're face to face, the more face to face it is, the more you are likely to experience positivity resonance. If you're interacting um, through uh, computer mediated interaction, it's not real time and very little to not, no sensory connection. There's a negative association between how much time you spend connecting that way and uh, positivity resonance. So face to face is the place where it's most prominent. We see um, kind of a zero correlation when it's, when it's um, some real time sensory connection like shared video or shared voice. Um, and I think that really depends on what people's intentions are. We've done a study, uh, one of my former doctoral students, Brett Major, did as a study, looked at tell people who were like telecommuters who work mostly from home and didn't go to a physical office space versus those who go to a physical office space. And we find that for those people who telecommute, the phone becomes their main way of positive connection with their colleagues. And so they have much more positivity resonance in a phone call than somebody who is with people face to face all day and they make a phone call and they find it deadening. Okay, so that's where I think we see that zero correlation for um, video and phone. And uh, I want to share with you the basically the bottom line of three different studies we did where we used this episode level measure of positivity resonance and linked it to different aspects of uh, well-being. We find that there's a reliable and um, strong correlation with flourishing mental health. Now, flourishing mental health is not just about being happy. It's also feeling like you have meaning, purpose, that you're part of a community. So it's like um, happy plus meaning, you know, those things together. Uh, it's also associated with having fewer depressive symptoms and less loneliness. It's not surprising that it would be less loneliness, but it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a construct validity there. And we also see in some of the studies, and marginal in others, and not in others, so it's unclear right now, um, but self-reported illness symptoms, people who are um, experiencing more positivity resonance report in some studies fewer aches, pains, colds, flus, acne, things like that. Now, of course, these are correlational findings um, that can go in uh, both directions, but it's interesting to see a strong association with uh, mental health. I want to share with you uh, a study that has a lot of rich components where we are completely unable to use this self-report measure of um, positivity resonance, and that's because the data were all gathered um, over the last, well, over 20 years, um, starting in the 1990, early 1990s, because I helped collect the data when I was a postdoc. And so when I had a sabbatical a couple years ago, I went back to the lab where I worked as a postdoc and said, I think we can test some of these ideas about positivity resonance with this existing data. And so um, Bob Levinson was a, uh, my uh, mentor and collaborator um, back in my postdoc years. And he and his team of amazing graduate students uh, have done this work with me. And what I love about it is completely not dependent on grant funding. We did this with zero grant funding, just all people power and existing data. Um, so I want to share with you a study about long-term marriages. And as I start to talk about love, positivity, resonance, and long-term marriage, I don't want to um, uh, mislead you to think that positivity resonance is only about romantic relationships. It is equally about day-to-day -day connections with others, but this is the data that I have to um, take a deep dive in on the concept with. So from 150 long-term married couples, they're defined as people who are married either 
15 years or more, that was half the sample, or 35 years and more, that was the other half of the sample. At the time the study was started, every single study of marriage was on newlyweds. And so it was a really big deal to, to be studying marriages that had lasted. And as part of this study, there are many different parts, but I'm going to focus in on a 15-minute conversation about an area of conflict within marriage. So we identified this by having people um, fill out a survey individually beforehand, which are the topics that you guys as a couple tend to disagree on, and there are things like money, uh, raising the kids, um, uh, how to keep house, um, eating, weight, things like that. Um, and so we picked something that was high, as high as possible on both of their lists. And we don't say, go argue. We say, try to advance your agreement on this. Have a conversation about this area of conflict. And how they take it from there is really up to them. It's typical, we, we are hoping that it is typical of how they might resolve conflict in real life. And so we have a 15 minute conversation. Um, during which we gather second-by-second second data on physiology. And so what, what is measured is um, pulse transit time to the ear and the finger, which is a loose correlate of blood pressure, heart rate, uh, skin conductance, sweat gland activity, uh, and finger pulse amplitude is the degree of vasoconstriction or sympathetic nervous system activation. We're also measuring how much people move around in their chair by having a, a, movement center under, a movement sensor underneath the chair that they're sitting in. And we also videotape them. So this is a, a couple that gave permission to have um, their likeness shown to audiences. And so here's them talking about their area of disagreement. And this is a really uh, nice data set because uh, an army of coders had already coded the specific emotions that each couple member expressed second by second through this whole 15 minute conversation. And this was based on John, John Gottman's work on leading researchers in marriage, especially emotion in marriage. And each second of both the speaker and the listener were coded as uh, expressing either positive affect, joy, humor, affection, validation, or a negative affect. Um, for the time, this was pretty typical to have way more negative emotions on people's emotion uh, coding lists than positive emotions, but got anger, whining, sadness, disgust, defensiveness, um, those kinds of things. So what we were able to do is identify each second within the videotape, how many seconds there was shared positivity that both the husband and the wife expressed positivity. And, when there, and we also um, measured when there was shared negativity or unshared emotion and so on. But another way that we looked at these videos is we compared this kind of coding system to a new coding system that we developed where we had, um, we took um, brand new coders and introduced them to the idea of positivity resonance, kind of like I've done for you already. It wasn't a really super in-depth training, but we asked them to watch a 30-second segment of the videotape and then rate, um, did positivity resonate between the two partners? Did they show actions, words, or voice intonation that conveyed a mutual warmth, mutual concern, mutual affection, or a shared tempo? like shared smiles, shared laughter. And so for each 30 second bin, that was coded as no, I didn't see any of that. One was I saw a little bit of that. Two, I saw a lot of that. And so then we aggregated those across the um, uh, 30, 30 second bins that made up the 15 minutes. And what we found was uh, this was a much better predictor of marital satisfaction of the couple than were the ways that affect had been measured previously as an individual phenomenon. So um, we can look at uh, how often that each individual was positive, uh, and we can also look at when there was shared positivity. Our measure, which takes much less coding hours, um, is a much better predictor of the, the couple's view of how positive their relationship is. And uh, one part of the study that I'm especially excited about is the parts where we get to look at biological synchrony. And here we use the physiological measures and that behavioral coding system. We use that behavioral coding system, the previous one, the, the SPATH coding that existed, to um, 
find moments of shared positivity and then look to see the degree to which there was physiological synchrony in those moments. So um, here's that same couple, they're having a moment of shared positivity. And how this was uh, coded was looking at the covariation in two people's physiological changes uh, second by second. So here we have um, a couple where this is a, a representation of actual heart rate data. This is interbeat interval. And so you see maybe the husbands up here in black and the wives in the gray. And what we do is take a rolling 30 second window and look at within each 30 seconds, what's the correlation between this line and this line. Okay, and you see both of these are kind of going up, and so there's the, the synchrony score is a positive correlation. Okay, so we do that rolling window across this whole uh, stretch, and I'm just going to show you two other instances. Here's one where um, the heart, the interview interval is going down, that's an increase in heart rate um, for each, and so the correlation there is, is pretty high on the synchrony score. And um, over here is a moment where they're not doing the same thing. One person's pretty steady, one's showing change, and so the correlation between those is low. So for each of these physiological measures, we get a measure of synchrony across the dyad. It's a dyad level score of synchrony. And we look, we've looked at them individually, physiological um, measure by physiological measure. We find that they all show a similar pattern, and so we aggregate them into a, a broader measure of physiological synchrony. Now, there's two ways that um, a couple's physiology could be in sync. One way is, you know, their heart rates are both increasing and they're both decreasing at the same time. That's called in-phase synchrony. They're synchronized in-phase. And then there's also anti-phase synchrony, where one is increasing, the other is decreasing like that, kind of mirroring each other. They're clearly in sync, but they're going in opposite directions. And so what we um, did, again, was take each second of uh, the 15-minute interaction and divide, uh, classify each second as a second of shared positivity or unshared positivity, um, shared negativity or unshared negativity, shared neutral. And uh, because we're doing the positive alone, we need to look at it separately for husbands and wives. But when we get to the shared data, it's the same for each. Uh, OK, so our prediction was that we'd see more biological synchrony when there's shared positive affect. That's actually a prediction that goes against a lot of um, ideas in affective science, which argue that bad is stronger than good, and there's going to be much more of a um, uh, a spreading of a uh, contagion of negative emotion and positive emotion. And so we were especially interested, um, well, this is the difference we predicted, that if you experience positive emotions together, there's more of this in-phase linkage um, than when you experience positive emotions alone. Really key uh, comparison is what happens with negative emotions. We um, see um, much less in-phase linkage uh, than um, uh, the positive emotions, and with neutral, we see no differences there. What's interesting with the negative is we see more of that anti-phase linkage, where one person's heart rate goes up and one goes down. It's like they're they're kind of taking turns feeling different things rather than feeling it in synchrony. We see the same exact pattern with lives. If you might remember that this was a sample that had middle-aged adults and older adults. We see the same pattern in middle-aged adults as in older adults. If you break it down by um, uh, each individual measure, we see pretty much the same pattern for each individual measure as well. So the shared positivity at the second by second level is associated with this physiological synchrony um, uh, really reliably. Now, you might ask, why do you care about this second by second synchrony? What value does that have? Well, the beauty of this data set is that it was collected over the course of 20 years. Of marriage. Now, in the outlying years, the sample dwindles, and we have um, fewer in the sample. We have found preliminary evidence that our measure of positivity resonance predicts who's in the study 20 years later. And then we look, well, why did people leave the study? Did they get divorced? Well, very few divorces, because these were people who had already made it to 15 and 35 years. The reason they were out of the study is that one of them died. 
And so we're now doing a study of getting death records of the whole sample to see if we can, above and beyond the typical predictors of longevity that come from psychology, just individual positive affect and individual social connection, just positivity resonance um, uh, link up above and beyond those. But what we do have here is data from over 10 years. We looked at how much positivity resonance coded in terms of shared positive affect second by second with the physiological linkage in that second. So couples who had more of that. Um, again, these were middle-aged and older adults, so their people's chronic illness load is going to increase typically across a decade for this age sample. What we, we find that that's true for people who have low positivity resonance. <coughs> for those who have higher positivity resonance, um, their expected increase in chronic illnesses across a decade didn't emerge. So it's kind of buffered against, um, uh, it was health protective over 10 years. I need to tell you that this is data for wives only. Uh, for whatever reason, and we have only speculation, uh, but for the husbands, we don't see a similar pattern. There, um, you might have your own ideas about why this uh, may be the case. The best idea that um, a really smart graduate student shared in a talk once was like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense, is that demographically, from a sociological perspective, we know that um, older women tend to have a wider friend network than older men. A lot of times for older men, their one close relationship is their spouse. So if uh, this, these markers of positivity resonance are typical of what older women are experiencing in all of their relationships, then to the extent that these moments of positivity resonance are health protective, they're having more of those moments in their day. So if they're have, getting a, a higher daily diet than someone who's just getting that, those connections within one relationship. So that's a possibility. We do not have the data to be able to test that in this uh, study, but it's, um, it will be a nice uh, series of dissertations for a lab somewhere to do that. Now, I spent all this time talking about um, uh, close relationships, marital relationships. I want to take a step back and point out that positivity resonance can equally be a feature of uh, what are called weak ties or your people, um, uh, your interactions with strangers and distant acquaintances, that um, there's some research by Liz Dunn and her team that shows that for college students, the emotional quality of their connections with strangers and acquaintances within a given day are a better predictor of their end of day mental well-being or emotional well-being than their interactions with close friends and others. So the quality of those connections that you have um, with uh, people you hardly know really are um, consequential for uh, mental health. I want to take just a moment to talk about two different areas in my own research where we look at kind of, kind of the, the possible connections. We've seen already in many areas of um, affective science, there's a connection between people who experience and express more positive emotions and longevity. And that uh, correlation, perspective correlation, has been a, kind of a mystery. Like, how it is that could these, how could these fleeting positive experiences be so predictive of longevity? And one way um, that we've been interested in studying this is through looking at heart rate variability. Heart rate variability is. Um, uh, closely connected to the body's ability to regulate well, not only the cardiovascular system, but also inflammation and glucose. Um, if you have a heart attack, your um, cardiologist may want to know your heart rate variability because that predicts how well you'll do post-infarction. Um, um, but psychologists are very interested in heart rate variability because people who have higher heart rate variability uh, that's the one that's also associated with health, are, have been shown to be uh, better at regulating their emotions, better at regulating their attention, and perhaps because of both of those, they're better, uh, they have higher social skill. So it seemed like this could be kind of a bridge construct, construct between psychological and um, emotions and social experience and health 
um, on, on the other end. And so we've done a study where we um, randomly assign people to learn to self-generate more experiences of positive um, emotion, but in particular positive emotion that are about caring and friendliness towards others. This is a study where we randomize people to learn um, loving kindness meditation versus being a weightless control. We measure their heart rate variability at the beginning of the study, and that actually predicts, as the past literature would suggest, predicts people's ability to get positive emotions out of their meditation practice. So showing that, the, you know, again, that's kind of following from the better able to regulate their attention and their emotions. And so when they practice meditation, they get more positive emotional boost. These are people with higher cardiac vagal tone or higher heart rate variability. Um, but we also see that three months later, the more positive emotions and the more positive social connections people reported on a day-to-day -day basis, because we asked people you know, for nine weeks to report on their emotions and social experiences at the end of every day, people who showed a, um, an increase in those showed the biggest increases in heart rate variability. Um, so uh, we know that becoming more physically fit having better cardiovascular fitness can improve your heart rate variability. This is the first study to show that improving your emotional and social experiences also has an effect on improving your um, heart rate variability. It's a, you know, an indicator of heart health. So that's one way. And, and one of the key mediators here was positive social experiences. So it was kind of a proxy measure of positivity resonance. I've also done some work where, we're look, where we've looked at and continuing to look at um, uh, cellular makeup in terms of um, uh, the gene expression profile uh, in the immune system. And in particular, there's some past research that had linked adversity, um, long-term psychological adversity, to a profile of gene expression in the immune system that's associated with the increased expression of pro-inflammatory genes and a decreased expression of antiviral and antibody synthesis genes. So it's kind of like when the body is experiencing um, acute or chronic social stress, there's like the immune system takes a double hit. It kind of turns you more towards um, the diseases of inflammation, arthritis, cardiovascular disease, some cancers, and, and getting worse at fending off viruses. And so a colleague of mine, Steve Cole, is kind of a pioneer of doing work in this area. And um, I heard him give a talk like 10 years ago. I had seen him a long time. We went to graduate school together. And I said, hey, Steve, remember me? Do you think this might have a relationship on the other side to positive experiences? So we were able to get funds to do another one of these studies where we randomized people to learn loving kindness meditation or a different kind of meditation, um, mindfulness. and. We look at um, changes in uh, gene expression. The, the first set of studies we found just looked at um, the degree to which people's existing levels of mental health, like their flourishing mental health, is related to their gene expression profile. And we uh, were the first to find that there's a connection between people's um, eudaimonic well-being, that they feel connected, part of a community, they have good social relationships. People who score high on that measure show a profile of, in gene expression in the immune system um, in their uh, leukocytes that is the opposite of this adversity pattern. They're showing uh, reduced expression of pro-inflammatory genes and higher expression of antiviral and antibody synthesis genes. And it's kind of like your immune system is kind of paying attention to your recent emotional history and preparing you for the microbial threats that are likely to be more present for you. So if you're very socially connected, it's useful to have better antiviral um, um, fighting uh, capacity within your immune system, because you're going to be cozied up with a lot of people, and that's where viruses spread. But if you're um, more chronically lonely, and this is the finding that um, Steve Cole and um, John Cassiopo had found in several different studies, chronic loneliness is associated with that adversity pattern. So your immune system is not so much preparing you to deal with viruses, but more with um, bacteria. And uh, with is the idea that maybe you'd be more likely to be uh, cast out of your community, 
as a, one of our human ancestors and uh, may need to um, uh, deal with you know, wounds of predation or come specific fighting and so your body uh, might be more, your immune system might be more geared to protecting you to things that might be uh, more immune uh, threats when you're isolated from others. So um, these are the kinds of ideas that have led me to conclude that uh, positivity resonance is a health behavior. Um, there's nice sociological evidence that puts it on par with you know, staying physically active, eating your fruits and vegetables, um, that these are things that we should be engaging in every day in order to be our healthy best. And the nice thing about it is that positive connections with others are, they are fleeting. They don't last, you know, a uh, tremendous amount of time. But neither is being physically active or eating your fruits and vegetables. But these are all forever renewable. We can start them up again um, in almost any circumstance where there are other people. And so I just want to close by touching on sort of like what are some interventions that allow people to experience more positivity resonance? And I want to say you've already been in one. You've listened to me talk about the concept for an hour. And that's actually much more than an intervention that we've tested already, where we just give people like a 10 minute overview of what positivity resonance is. And we say, go have more of these moments in your day with strangers and acquaintances and, and people you know. And if when people take that on as an assignment over um, three weeks' time, three weeks later they're scoring higher on flourishing mental health, lower on loneliness, lower on depression. Uh, there are other things that we found increase people's positivity resonance. I touched on that we've done studies of formal meditation, um, both mindfulness and loving kindness meditation turn out to be great routes to increasing positive emotions and loving kindness in particular increases people's sense of positive connections with others in daily life but mindfulness does that a bit too so they're not so starkly different and we uh, i'm also just working on a manuscript now where we're looking at informal meditation so as people in our studies were being trained in meditation, which is like sitting, uh, formal meditation, is sitting down to, um, in time where you're not going to be disturbed and maybe listening to a guided meditation and engaging in what's considered formal practice. Informal practice is engaged when you're like in the flow of daily activities, maybe as you're walking in from your, where you park to your office or while you're waiting for the microwave oven to count down and you're standing in front of there for lunch. So that you just kind of switch your attention either to being in the present moment, focusing on your breath, or um, uh, wishing somebody well who you see off in the distance and just like, oh, I hope that person has a nice day, <laughs> you know, something. That those kinds of moments um, add up and increase people's um, positive emotions day to day and their experiences of positive connection, kind of being, um, in, feeling integrated with others and sort of on the same page with others. Um, there's also, if, if you're interested in some of these ideas and you're like, oh, I want to share this with somebody else or you want to go a little deeper on it, with my university I created a, a six-week, very short MOOC um, that uh, conveys the ideas that are basically foundational in my, posit my book Positivity and the, the Barn and Build Theory, but also spends equal time talking about positivity resonance and uh, benefits. It has a lot of, it's geared for people who have no background in anything and um, just kind of want to understand more. There have been um, uh, about 200,000 people who have taken this course from all over the world, most of them from um, non-English speaking countries and, uh, and a good chunk from emerging economies. So I'm really pleased with how far uh, some of the ideas that we come up with in the ivory tower can reach in terms of uh, people's interest. So another way, another sort of life hack that can be useful for, you know, if you're thinking, oh, this idea of positivity resonance sounds interesting. I'd like to create uh, more of this in my life. My colleague, Pascal Sheeran, has done this great work on if-then plans, which basically, to unlock an if-then plan, all you have to do is decide where, when, and how you might want to do something differently. Um, like for me, I know I don't want to use my, I don't want to text while I drive. So I say, if I'm in the car and I 
reach my hand over to my phone, then I'll say, hey, don't do that. You want to be alive. And so it's, it's that. <laughs> It's a way of using your um, automatic cognitions to trigger you to your intentions in the right moment. So it kind of offloads your, your behavioral intentions into automatic processing. And so it could be the case that um, you think, when I'm in the presence of others and I feel the temptation to pick up my phone and disengage from these people and engage with these people, that I'll pull my phone away and I'll try to connect with the people in my midst. Um, so I just want to uh, end by focusing on what a smile is for, getting back to this question. Now there's uh, one take in science on what a smile is for. This comes from uh, Paul Ekman's work, is that a smile expresses an otherwise hidden internal state. Another set of researchers have flipped that on his head and say what a smile is for is to evoke positivity in another, not necessarily just to express it. Uh, another uh, set of researchers have argued that a smile, when it's mimicked, creates this intersubjectivity, allows you to kind of know a little bit better in your gut what another person is feeling. Others have said it helps broaden collective mindsets and build collective resources. That was some researchers who took some of these other ideas and linked them with uh, broad and build theory. And what I'm arguing is that it's all of the above. You don't have to choose between these alternate theories of what a smile is for that it can be both a way to express positivity, trigger it, and to the extent that we see connections with heart health, with immune health, then a smile functions as a bid, when it's an affiliative smile, to enter into this life-giving moment of positivity resonance. So um, with that, I just want to end here and take your questions if you have them. So thank you. I see that I've gone on long, so if you do have to just get up and leave, I totally get that. I know some of you have had another class, but um, yeah, I have a question to start. The, um, we noticed 90% of people, when they got frustrated, smiled uh, with, you know, with their eyes and their mouth, the uh -huh. true smile of happiness, but clearly they were not happy. Uh -huh. um, would you say that's playing, that's probably playing with a whole bunch of Exactly. Yeah. Specifically it could be um, an attempt to kind of disengage a little bit with the frustration and kind of take a step back and think, oh, what am, how did I get into this? You know, um, and uh, we know that uh, positive emotional experiences can help people um, undo or get out of negative emotional experiences. So there's a way in which there's a uh, positive emotions and, ex and facial, positive facial expressions can be used as emotion regulation tools. That's one possibility that's just showing up as an automatic um, way of regulating emotion. Yeah, it seems like here it could make you feel better and broaden your mindset to try to find a way out of that frustrating situation. Right, yeah. So yeah, what you, that's what kind of what I meant by kind of take a step back and kind of think about the situation more generally rather than just be continuing stuck with that impasse. Great question. In the back. Um, do you think positivity resonance is possible with like a computer or anything that's not a human? For example, if yeah. you interact with a robot or with like what is honesty or trueness? Right. Um, we're actually, I have a philosophy um, doctoral student who's working with me and we're trying to um, uh, beginning to forge a connection with a researcher who's created uh, rapport in human agents. You, Jonathan Ratch's work, you probably may know it. Um, and uh, there's, we want to see whether those rapport features, which are uh, a lot of them based on synchrony and timing and shared smiles, when the um, artificial agent is showing those things back that we typically experience, um, those have already been shown to relate to rapport. Um, rapport is a concept that's really close to positivity resonance, but without some of the other features of biomethavioral synchrony. And, um, uh, but it has that kind of mutual care piece in it. So I think there's already um, indirect evidence that you can have those connections. Now, the question is, what happens when you realize the artificial agent really hasn't been listening? or um, uh, taking in information in the way you would have expected for a human. 
Uh, so there's, you know, that might work. The, these rapport bots have been shown to be really good at capturing more information in sensitive interviews, like with um, veterans coming back and getting an interview about PTSD symptoms, because it seems to create this comfort and, and, and plus anonymity, so that there's um, more kind of personal relevation that allows people to get the help that they need. So as a diagnostic interview, I think that's a key piece. But we want to um, do some studies to see if um, doing an interview with an artificial agent that has the capacity to build rapport then uh, creates more of an interest in connecting with other humans when you're not interacting, uh, when you move from interacting with the artificial agent to a human. So is it a way to keep our social skills highly attuned rather than you know, all this interaction with uh, uh, artificial agents, you know, we don't necessarily have to be polite to our Alexas, you know, but with, a, with an um, artificial agent that's kind of responsive to you, that might keep our social skills at a sharp level so that when we turn to interacting with humans after lots of interactions with artificial humans, that you're not clumsy. Because social skills, we found, is a, it's a skill that if you don't use it, it starts to erode a bit, so it might help us stay in, in um, well, well tuned for social interaction. Great question. Yes. All right. So I, I have two two questions. Um, so I'm curious because um, you mentioned the loving kindness meditation and positivity gratitude is kind uh -huh. of playing a role now. I'm just curious if you kind of if we're kind of currently your thinking is around how positive positivity resonance relates to building in terms of. It maybe mediating it more so than kind of other aspects, you know, other other sort of positive emotions that um, you know come from your body, um, uh -huh. part of your theory. Um, so I'm curious, kind of about a positive, positive, positive resonance may, might, uh, I guess, you know, differentially impact a person's likelihood to build in yeah. a lot of resources. And then I'm also kind of curious about um, kind of the model of love, in a sense, um, kind of. I know you mentioned that there was a kind of a a second component or like two factor psychology um, mm -hmm. to it. Um, but I was but I was kind of curious when a person says you know, they, they love like you know their pet or they love right. like, their matching object, whatever, <laughs> like right. how does that kind of factor into the model considering right. the different right. um, the taking your first question, this uh, analogy that I make to a superfood, um, my prediction is that positive emotions that we co experience with others do uh, help us build more rapidly in terms of building our resourcefulness. Now, it could be that it's uh, merely a quantitative difference because if you're experiencing a, this is a, um, known from the research on capitalization, if you have a positive emotional experience that's a solo experience and then you go share it with a friend, you get to re-experience the positivity of that. And then if that friend responds in an active and constructive way and says, oh, tell me more, that's a really cool honor, versus saying, oh, everybody gets that prize. You know? um, but if they respond well, that increases positivity as well. So when we um, co-experience positive emotions, the positive emotion tends to grow and build for a little bit longer. So it's like, if it's a, if it's a healthy ingredient, you're getting a higher dose of it. Um, uh, we don't quite know if it's um, synergistically different or just quantitatively different. The positivity resonance is a lot, allows you to have kind of slightly longer episodes that are slightly more intense. Um, and uh, the other question was... I'm um, like, you're yeah, right, so like if, um, a, say a person says, you know, I love their oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Love their how's, how's that kind of up here into the model? Yeah, I think that um, you can co-experience positive emotions, especially with your mammal pets. You know, because the eye contact, and people who are dog owners, I'm not a dog owner, but people who are dog owners are saying, oh, when my dog looks me in the eye, I know exactly what they're feeling. And, you know, that's a uh, form of connection. Um, and then, uh, you know, that could be just like the pre-verbal infants. You're kind of connecting with your, uh, especially dogs. Dogs have the best research on how they um, uh, contribute to emotional well-being. I'm a cat person, I kind of take that issue, because cats don't seem to have as much ability to change people's uh, mental health. But um, I think for your uh, bee pets, <laughs> or your reptile pets, it's just less 
that's without sharing more similarities in your nervous system, I think it's less likely. Now, when people say they really love a possession, I think that is, you know, that's certainly a way that people tend to use the word love, but it's just outside the scope of my theory. Because I'm really talking about these um, building block moments that happen with, between and among people. And so, um, uh, you know, some colleagues of mine have said, oh, I really like what you're theorizing here, just don't call it love. <laughs> and the reason I persisted in the face of that criticism is that uh, we already, as a society, put love on a pedestal. We say it makes the world go round. We say this is the most important thing in life. And I'm trying to say that these little moments in positivity resonance deserve that um, elevation. They need, you know, they need to be taken with that much um, importance and respect. And I think if I just call it positivity resonance, people are like, yeah, hold on, I can live with or without positivity resonance. But if you think love, it's like, oh, well, that's so it's part to get the idea to have as much um, uh, draw as possible. So I'm part thinking of communicating with wide audiences too. So, yes. Um, do you know of any interventions with children or youth? I'm thinking about you know health class for junior high kids, that kind of thing. Ah, kind of interesting. Yeah, um, I have a, a close connection with a woman who started a. Um, group that's kind of running wild in schools, elementary schools right now, about um, uh, being more grateful and kind. But not starting with gratitude, starting with kindness. Um, it's Looking for the Good Project, or if you just Google Look for the Good Project or something like that, it's, uh, it's really about trying to uh, help. It started as an anti-bullying intervention and kind of broadened into just creating more positive communities. And I think the reason it's really taken off is it's designed to be completely run by kids. By kids for kids. So it gives, you know, um, eight-year-olds this kind of community leadership opportunity and kind of gives them a little structure. It's much better than having adults come in there and say, be kind, be grateful. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, doesn't play very far. So, but adolescents, um, uh, I think, yeah, that's a really um, important time to kind of bring in these ideas, kind of saying, you know, there are positive connections outside of romantic or sexual connections that are really important to keep maintaining. So, it's a nice idea. Yes? Um, I have a question on the five love languages, mm -hmm. which was by uh, Dr. Gary. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned about the correlation uh, of which you measured the synchrony. Uh, how would you comment on, because everybody expresses themselves differently, mm -hmm. like some people value physical touch versus some right. people value quality time. Right. So how would you uh, mention that, how would you want to have a personalized correlation right. to address right. to those people when you do a study? Right. Well, you know, as a social psychologist, I'm the, when, when you're looking across all the ways in which the world and people vary, as a social psychologist, I'm looking for what's in common across people. Um, I also have training as a personality psychologist, which is looking at how people differ from one another. This theory is really looking at the common thread. Now, that doesn't mean those individual differences and in styles of how you want to communicate don't also exist there. Um, we're, uh, uh, we're just focusing on more of the commonalities. A typical thing that we do, though, is look at uh, what's called the big five personality traits, um, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and see if people with those constellation of traits, is this more, uh, is this just extroverts we're talking about? We know that's not the case. Introverts show the same sort of positivity resonance that extroverts do. So it's one way to kind of put the research on what's the common thread through the paces to make sure that it's not just being carried by a certain group. So. Yes. Uh, I was wondering whether the mm -hmm. subjects have ever uh, seen the feedback, like seen the signals themselves as they were going through the experiment. The, uh, in the couple study? Yes. Yeah. Um, no, they didn't see um, that connection, but they did do, there's, a, there's another layer of data that we are also working with. A week after they have that conversation, they come back to the research lab and watch the videotape of their interaction and they rate, using a rating dial, how positive or negative they themselves were feeling at the time of the conversation. After they do that, they watch the video another time and they rate how they think their partner is feeling. 
And so we can measure from that uh, empathic accuracy, or, or, and we can also measure just how much do you project positivity onto your partner. So we're finding that those things are um, closely connected to positivity resonance too. So do you, do you think that if, if, say, we had augmented reality glasses or something like that, and when we looked at, say, important people in our lives, we could see how synchronized we are yeah. with them, what kind of effect do like, you think will be yeah. a positive kind of connection? Yeah. You know, I have this take on biofeedback, which probably, um, I don't know, maybe doesn't go so well in this context, but I think that um, by nature's design, we have really great built-in biofeedback. It's called emotions. Um, I don't know why somebody's calling me right now. Let me just turn it off. Um, it's one of those times where sorry, I can't talk right now really helps. <laughs> but um, I think giving people more skills of understanding what emotion they're feeling and when um, uh, is potentially more valuable rather than taking people outside of their inner experiencing and looking at a number or a, a projection, you know, which, which just almost by definition splits your attention between interacting and then how's the interaction going? Interacting, how's the interaction going? Having that split attention is going to derail the interaction. So, um, but even thinking about one's own emotions during the interaction can derail as well. But I think after you're outside of the interaction, you think, how did I feel? And um, that may be better than seeing uh, a number on a scale that is a readout of how did you feel. Do you know what I mean? Um, emotions are nature's biofeedback. That's another way to put it. Yes, you and your lunch. Sure. Um, somewhat to your last point about whether or not these findings generalize across personality types, I'm wondering if in your studies you select for healthy individuals, so people who don't have mental illnesses, for example, because I, I'm wondering if, for example, you know, severely depressed person might be impervious to just perceived responsiveness, right? Have right. an inability to feel cared for, despite people actually being invested in their well-being. Yeah. So do you, do you select for those? We, we typically take everybody who's interested in our studies, but I should say that we have found that people who come to studies that are run by the PEP lab, Positive Emotions Psychophysiology Lab, we end up getting um, higher mental health scores than we would otherwise, okay. But, um, and then other people's work shows us too that um, the people who are, uh, most people find interaction to be safe. And so positivity resonance, if you find interaction with other people to be safe and interesting and a source of positive emotion, that's great because that can even improve mental health even further. The groups of people who do not find social interaction to be safe, they feel like it's too risky, are people who are depressed, chronically lonely, which is kind of extra poignant because you're feeling lonely, but you um, perceive just everyday interaction as a risk, and so you hang back more. And sort of why chronic loneliness kind of is a uh, self-sustaining system, and um, people with social anxiety, um, really strong social anxiety. So those are, you know, clear affective disorders that are linked to um, kind of put up a barrier to feeling safe in social circumstances. And some of the prerequisites, I think, that are, are foundational for allowing positivity residents to emerge, one is perceived safety. And the other is real-time sensory connection. Um, so those are two that I've argued are, are the conditions that need to be in place for this to emerge. And so from that, I say, somewhat provocatively, love is not unconditional. <laughs> because there are certain conditions that set the stage um, that are perceived safety is one of them. So, yes? Uh, taking this theory, do you think you can really apply to different spheres of life? Because you are really positioning it for like personal examples, like marriage, etc. Because if you take your example with digesting, whatever emotion is, positive or negative, we need to digest it. And from uh, like MRI and some other studies, they are actually equal. Whatever it is, positive or negative, we will take equal time to process the emotion, etc., etc. Obviously, potential effort longer is um. a bit different. So, do you think in some situations, like workplaces and some other? spheres, 
this is actually no go places, or sometimes it should be restrained because yeah. it will actually uh, derive our attention and we will spend time, like for example, previous questions. Yeah. Well, you do need to analyze, even if it is positive and good, and it actually mm -hmm. might break our interaction or whatever process we are engaged in. Yeah, I think it really depends on the nature of work. Mm -hmm. If people are working in teams, mm -hmm. then I think um, uh, positivity resonance is part of what allows you to work, um, to kind of become one as a team and kind of pass the baton in really quick ways and kind of understand what each person needs. That, perspective taking. Now there's some work that isn't like that, mm -hmm. that is um, much more absorbed and looking at mm -hmm. for the errors in a long contract or in a long sequence of programming or code. So there, mm -hmm. if, if it's a certain kind of mental labor, then I, I can see your point. I think it really depends on the nature of work. Mm -hmm. There is a whole area of um, in um, organizational studies and positive psychology where they've mixed called mm -hmm. positive organizational studies. Mm -hmm. And um, it turns out that positive emotions at work are part of what helps creativity and teamwork and just really depends on what kind of work you're doing, I think. So there's no way it's, I don't think it's possible to make a generalization one way or another because of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes? I'm curious about uh, your, the relationship between uh, positivity resonance and the decision making process, uh, just to see if you've done any studies or how it influenced there. Um, the second part to this is, uh, micro-intervention and mm -hmm. informal uh, mm -hmm. meditations. There's work that's being done at Harvard with uh, Ellen Langer, like Langerian mindfulness, so to speak, more mm -hmm. so as a novelty-seeking and, uh, and producing approach to that. And a lot of the studies, you know, that a lot of your work uh, kind of runs in parallel to that as far as the findings go. I, mean, I was just wondering if you were familiar with that work and if there's any type of you know, cross between that. Yeah, well, um, one piece of uh, Ellen Langer's work that I really think um, is a nice example of this. I don't, I don't, I haven't followed every uh, step of the way of her work, um, but I do see points of connection. The one that I love is the orchestra study, where um, they have an orchestra either um, uh, try to go on stage and play a past perfect performance. So they say, okay, this last performance was perfect. Let's go do it again. Let's have a perfect performance. Um, and then a different condition, they tell the orchestra to um, really get in sync with the other people in the orchestra and really play together. And then they ask the audience which, um, uh, perf or, or what, the degree to which they like the performance. The audience loves the synchrony. The synchrony amongst the players is what leads to a, uh, a subjective group rating of a better performance. And so that, I think, is getting at this um, uh, working together piece. So it's, again, it's work that is about matching togetherness. So um, in, uh, uh, I use a, a bit of that example in, a, in my book, Love 2.0, I talked to one of my friends who um, was learning uh, how to jam when she was playing her electric guitar. And uh, that, that sort of uh, unnameable piece, what makes it really great is when you start really playing off each other well. And um, so parts, parts of that collaboration, I mean, other work other than music making is like that, but music making, you kind of, it's the synchrony made audible, you know, so, yes? Uh, so, um, are there any studies where, um, that look at how positi positivity resonance ex is expressed in, uh, across different social groups, like how it can be uh, used to improve relationship between or interaction between different social groups. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, the work in this area is so new that re there's the only lab that's using the concept of positivity resonance is my lab right now, and so our papers are just getting out there. So I, um, we haven't done a study like that, but I do think that um, there's a lot of potential there. And so for researchers who are beginning to try to figure out how interracial interaction or how um, intergenerational interaction just um, can come together, I think that the unifying factor of emotions is um, a really key uh, place. I mean, some of my grad students will say, oh, did you see that thing on Oprah where they brought people who were Trump voters versus um, Clinton voters into a room, and then they, they actually experienced emotions together and they left as friends. You know, well, that you could rewrite that in terms of positivity resonance, so. But I don't know of any formal studies. Yes? Uh, I'm curious about the 
Well, this is great. Please um, join me in thanking you.